Good evening and welcome to the news hour. After two days and six rounds of votes, the House of Representatives has still not elected a leader. Nearly two dozen Republicans have blocked Congressman Kevin McCarthy from taking the gavel and there's no end in sight. Lisa Desjardins begins our coverage of the continued battle between party leaders and the chamber's hardliners. Not quite chaos, but for Republican leaders and for the House in general, certainly a frenzy of questions without answers. We'll see what, we'll see what happens. As Kevin McCarthy continued to insist he would prevail as Speaker of the House, despite being well short of votes. It doesn't matter, I still have the most votes. So we could go through every yeah, name in the conference and be at the end of the day, and we'll be able to get there. Meanwhile, in the chamber, an opening prayer for the Times. Holy God, in these days of uncertainty and change, we turn to you who are the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And not good for McCarthy, Groundhog Day. With the, the words of yesterday. I rise today to nominate the gentleman from California, Kevin McCarthy. I rise to nominate Kevin McCarthy for Speaker of the House. I rise to nominate Kevin McCarthy. For that On repeat today. I nominate Kevin McCarthy. And still, no one saw even the shadow of a speaker. A speaker has not been elected. The same 20 Republicans kept up their opposition to McCarthy, a group strongly pro-Trump and anti-establishment. A seat place nomination for speaker. But this time offering up a new candidate, Florida Congressman Byron Donalds. Another change, McCarthy lost the support of Victoria Sparts, who voted present, helping the opposition. After that, the House floor was a sea of arbitration, some huddles aiming to persuade and others clear disputes. McCarthy got one big boost from former President Donald Trump, who told Punchbowl News that he backs McCarthy as speaker and that it's time to make a deal to get down to work. But on the fifth ballot, prominent Trump supporter Lauren Boebert made a pointed suggestion. The president needs to tell Kevin McCarthy that, sir, you do not have the votes and it's time to withdraw. And with that, I yield. Thank you. McCarthy insists he will not. But meantime, the House itself is paralyzed. There is no speaker, the signs above that office taken down. There are also no members. None can take the oath of office until a speaker is elected. House Democrats pointed out that committees are frozen and they are stymied from some basic constituent work. Good morning, everyone. This is a crisis of the Congress. Uh, and it's a crisis at the hands of the Republican dysfunction. President Biden weighed in while leaving the White House this morning. How do you think this looks to the rest of the world? I know you know international relations. It's not a good look. It's not a good thing. It's the United States of America. And I hope they get their act together. Republicans' fate is in their own hands, but none yet seem to know where or when this will end. And Lisa joins us now from Capitol Hill, where lawmakers will continue the search for a new speaker later tonight. Lisa, welcome. Good to see you. Just bring us up to speed. Now, you've been following every twist and every turn. Where do things stand right now? Here we are, Amna. In the next couple of hours, we expect the House to return uh, from an adjournment it has taken. Now, what's going on behind closed doors is Kevin McCarthy and his allies are trying to identify any of those 20 who have voted in opposition to him, um, 21 actually, who could be persuadable. But I will tell you, I have spoken to trusted Republican sources, some in and close to leadership, allies of Kevin McCarthy, who have told me just in the last half hour on the, that they think, frankly, he will not be able to make up this gap. You think about it this way. He has to persuade more than a dozen of his members to change a vote in opposition to him, and none of them are budging. So these allies, these sources I've talked to for a long time, tell me, frankly, someone has got to tell Mr. McCarthy that it is over or nearly over. A very blunt assessment that this may be ending. Momentum is almost gone for him. However, from those around McCarthy, they say they have some potential other plans. One may be trying to switch the threshold for a vote from a majority, which it is now, to a plurality, meaning whoever has the most number of votes. That, to my knowledge, has never happened before. It's untested and it's also a risk because, as you know, McCarthy now is receiving fewer votes than the Democrat Hakeem Jeffries. Lisa, you remember you mentioned the, the people opposed to Mr. McCarthy there. The numbers remain largely unchanged, right? What can you tell us about them? What is it that those members of that opposition want and is there anyone else that they would back? 
There are two things happening with that group, as we've talked about. Let's first dive into the substance. This is a group that really wants to make it easier to make changes and propose ideas on the House floor. They're fiscal conservatives. So among that, they would like to be able to propose amendments and get votes on amendments that cut spending at any time. They also would like to make sure there's no massive spending bills, only spending bills by individual refined topics. And they would like it so that any single member of the Republican conference can challenge the speaker. That is something that uh, many people People believe would disrupt the chamber too much. But that's something that they say could be healthy. Overall, though, Amna, when you think about it, in terms of what's happening right now, more and more the demand of this group is simply someone other than Kevin McCarthy. When they're asked exactly what they want, sometimes they will name committee assignments, sometimes other specifics. But they've gotten so many of their demands already from Mr. McCarthy that it really is coming down mostly now to personality and a lack of trust in McCarthy himself. Lisa, we have to point out there are real world consequences to all of this unfolding in the way that it is. When you step back from the vote tallies and the negotiations, what is at stake here for the people, for the Americans who sent these lawmakers to Congress to do their jobs? Very serious consequences. In fact, just ahead in the next few weeks, the debt ceiling must be raised. That is one of the most profound uh, fiscal cliffs that this country can ever approach. And if Republicans cannot agree on this speaker vote, which itself revolves around fiscal politics, there are real danger signs ahead. Speaking to Senate Republicans, they're quite concerned. But on a lower level, on the, none of these folks are technically members of Congress right now. So there are issues. Most constituent service is happening. If you need a passport, they can still help you. But new members, I'm told, are having trouble with things as simple as opening up their new offices because they are not yet technically members of Congress. Lisa, no one knows Congress like you do. You've covered them for years. You've covered gridlock and dysfunction. Have you ever seen anything on this level before? This is, I, I just can't stress enough how unprecedented, I've seen so many unprecedented things in the last couple of years, but this is really near the top. Among the other things I want to impress upon people is the rules of the House govern the spaces, the lives, our time here in this building, what you can wear. There are no House rules right now. And among other things, this allowed me, a member of the press, to shoot this video today from my location, something I've never been able to show you. This is what it looks like from where I sit over the House chamber. I know that might not look all of that amazing, but I've never been able to show you that before because we've never had this long of a period in between Congresses where I could just get permission to shoot because there's no rules. And it is just a bizarre and quite amazing time. There are no rules. That is quite a statement. Lisa Desjardins reporting for us from Capitol Hill. For a Republican perspective now, Doug High has seen these leadership votes up close. He's the former communications director to House Majority Leader Eric Cantor and for the Republican National Committee. Doug, welcome. Good to see you. It's good to be with you. So here we are. Kevin McCarthy has failed to win the necessary votes in six rounds of voting. That number against him has remained largely unchanged. This is just a game of chicken now. It's a stalemate. It is a game of chicken. And what we see is it's sort of similar in a way to the 2016 primaries towards the end when it was clear that Donald Trump was at most favored to win. And you saw a lot of candidates say, somebody needs to get out of that race. You need to get out, not me. So you see House moderates, Republican moderates, flexing their muscles for the first time. We've heard about them flexing muscles before, but they really didn't even know where the gym is, versus the 20 or so who are opposing um, McCarthy right now. And they're trying to see who will blink first, and it's just not clear. You heard in Lisa's reporting there, her sources telling her it may be time for McCarthy to get out soon. Do you think he should step back? I think at this point, he's going to keep going um, and try and draw draw out opposition to see where, where folks are and who we can pull. We hear mixed things. Some folks saying, well, maybe it's time to move on. Others saying, well, it's encouraging some of the things out of here. What that says is this is going to be a long time. And if, if we think it's been a long time just in two days, the Senate doesn't come back until January 23rd. And in theory, aside from some of the very serious things that Congress does and needs to do, we're still playing with Monopoly money until that date. You think this could go until January 23rd? Absolutely. There, if nobody budges, we're going to keep going and going, unfortunately. So when you talk about the real world implications, as you heard Lisa just talking about them as well, there are very real things that impact millions of Americans. Is any of that resonating with the lawmakers who are saying we, we may hold out till January 23rd? Not yet, because we're still seeing the sideshow. And I think most voters don't realize the real world uh, both policy and political implications. So a good example is, as Lisa mentioned, there are no committees yet. What that means is there's no House Intelligence Committee. The leadership of what would be that committee aren't getting the briefings that they need. The Senate are, 
Senate uh, House Intel members are. The House aren't. That's very important stuff. And politically, for Republicans, you know, Joe Biden said that he was going to be a normalizer as a president. He's going to work in a bipartisan manner. So he was in Kentucky today with Mitch McConnell as Republicans were demonstrating a mo two months after the elections where voters said, we don't like the direction of this Republican Party, saying we can't organize ourselves. You know, McCarthy banked on the idea that by embracing President Trump, by accommodating this far-right faction, he would secure the speakership, mm -hmm. right? And he was wrong. Should he have seen this coming? Well, I think one of the things that's been surprising as, as a fallout from the elections is Donald Trump's voice isn't as important as it was uh, just two months ago. And so we saw, you know, Lauren Boebert, as Trumpy as it gets, saying, well, actually, Donald Trump needs to do this. And so we're seeing that there's a Trumpy part of the party that doesn't necessarily need Trump. That's why we are exactly where we are right now. If this gets sorted tomorrow or a week from now or January 23rd, what about the damage done? I mean, what does this say about this incoming House majority and how they will or won't be able to govern? Uh, that's, that's the very real implication of all of this. Look, if we've had two days of real drama, there's some damage there. But it also depends on what still happens. If this gang of 20, so to speak, and there are all kinds of bad nicknames about them, mm -hmm. if they are successful in this, it means whomever is speaker is going to have some handcuffs on them. And it starts with the fiscal cliff, obviously. But every part of governing uh, that a House majority that Republicans were excited to have in November uh, becomes very real questions of whether or not they can operate. I know you say you don't believe McCarthy is stepping back now. When do you think the right time is for someone like Kevin McCarthy to step back? And who is the viable alternative? Who could step in and get those votes? It starts with whether or not he loses votes. So if the next vote tonight or tomorrow, whatever it may be, he has 24 people voting for him or then 26 people, then writing is clear on the wall. Right now we're still in the stalemate. After that, we don't know. We don't know if, if this same group of 20 is going to say that Steve Scalise is unacceptable. And if that's the case, we're in the Wild West. And there are a lot of people who are talking about other members. But it's the Wild West, and no one knows precisely what's going to happen. I just have to ask, because you have seen a lot of fights like this. Not like this. Not like this. Where does this stand in sort of the, the pantheon of the battles that you've seen in within the Republican Party? No one has seen anything like this before. Obviously, we thought it was unprecedented with what Donald Trump did. But we've got to go back now to the, to the mid-1800s to see an example like this. And when we talk about there hadn't been a second vote for speaker until since 1923, that means no one who is alive in America right now was working on that vote or really knows what it was like to go through it. This is uncharted territory. Uncharted territory, indeed. Doug, hi. Thank you so much for being thank you. here.